Now, what we are going to do is we're going to zoom in uh, on the issues facing uh, forced migrants uh, in higher education. So I'd like to welcome our speakers and pass the chair to uh, uh, Professor Marie uh, Glissipi, who uh, will introduce them. Over to you, Marie. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, we now have four um, great speakers with uh, quite a, a considerable experience behind them. Um, and first of all, I, I'd like to welcome and introduce Mariam Taha. Mar Mariam um, works for the City of Sanctuary um, and she is responsible for the Universities of Sanctuary. So first up, over to you, Mariam. Good morning, everyone. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Marie, for that kind introduction. And thanks uh, so much for all the wonderful speakers so far for the really inspirational talks. Um, I would like to thank Swansea City of Sanctuary and the Open University teams for organizing this really great and important conference. And it's a, a delight to be part of it today. Um, I'm really happy to be presenting at the higher education plenary session, especially. Um, so my name is uh, Mariam, as Marie said, and I work um, at uh, City of Sanctuary UK in the national team as the coordinator for Universities of Sanctuary. And today I'm hoping to give you uh, more of a background and an over overview of the program as uh, what you know you might be interested in knowing what the Universities of Sanctuary initiative is, um, how the program looks like and what higher education institutions are doing across the UK to um, support um, and create this culture of welcome and inclusivity for people seeking sanctuary and not only students but their communities as well. And I'm very excited to hear more about uh, the Welsh perspective later on from great speakers in the session about what the universities in Wales are doing as well to contribute to this um, inclusivity, understanding and um, facilitating uh, access to education. Uh, I want to kind of start my presentation by reiterating the key messages that were said um, and most recently now by Stephanie and all the other uh, wonderful speakers about the key message and the purpose of this conference and it's to recognize the barriers and the challenges that unfortunately people seeking uh, sanctuary and those that have um, had to flee to the UK face when seeking education and uh, employment opportunities. And I think it's um, it's fair to say that we all recognize how fundamental accessing higher education is, uh, paving the way for people to either access uh, education, continue it or even requalify. Um, and recognizing today at this conference the host of um, cultures and experiences and skills that people seeking sanctuary enrich our societies with. Um, so equal access to higher education, as uh, some of you may know, is embodied in uh, Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of human rights um, and I think it's it's one of the the main things that helps people build professional networks here and and rebuild their lives again and contribute to society in a positive way uh, yet unfortunately for many people as we know um, going to university or accessing education can be um, can seem like an impossible goal or something that they don't even um, have the chance to consider uh, for me personally, when I applied uh, five years ago now to university, I applied as an asylum seeker and it was definitely, it definitely seemed like an impossible goal for me to access. Uh, but uh, fortunately, because there was scholarships and support in place, I was able to um, continue my education just as my other peers. And I did feel like there was an opportunity for me to feel equal to all the, the other students in my college. So um, I'm going to speak to you more about that today and what the universities are doing to help um, in, in this movement of, of um, facilitating this accessibility. Uh, to understand more about how the University of Sanctuary fits in, so the City of Sanctuary is a network contributing um, to this movement of welcome um, and inclusion and it does this by creating different um, networks of places of sanctuary so you might have heard of um, uh, local groups of sanctuary um, libraries of sanctuary gardens theaters of sanctuary and we, there are also kind of so it's mainstream organizations and institutions um, committed and pledging to the principles and the values of city of sanctuary so there are schools of sanctuary universities of sanctuary and also uh, most recently further education colleges of sanctuary promoting 
understanding and um, uh, empathy to, towards the, the challenges that people face um, when they fe seek protection here. So since this movement began in 2005 in Sheffield, um, over 100 City of Sanctuary initiatives have been established by local people. And the key part of, of this movement has been starting with working locally with the communities that directly work with and support and get uh, uh, kind of interact and communicate with people um, that uh, seek sanctuary here. So these streams have developed and one of them, one of those streams is the Universities of Sanctuary stream. And I would say that it's one of the biggest programs in terms of reach and in terms of impact, um, really empath emphasizing how prominent and powerful higher education institutions can be at building, creating the momentum, building it and also influencing a policy change, which we have seen at, with kind of great examples uh, previously. So this is where the Universities of Sanctuary program came in. It's a collaboration between universities themselves, their local communities, and also really great expertise guidance from organizations that specialize in access to higher education. For example, uh, Refugee Education UK, Article 26, Students Action for Refugees, Refu Aid, and many other wonderful organizations that came together to help understand what those challenges are, to inform universities of how they can implement processes to overcome those challenges, but also um, having direct contact with the students and learning from the universities themselves about what help and support they need um, to be able to um, uh, provide the most successful and most positive experience for forced migrant students um, throughout their university um, experience. So it's about kind of collaborative working and um, City of Sanctuary itself provides the support to the resources and the opportunities needed, but universities themselves themselves work collaboratively in the network um, uh, really well. And um, there are so far 22 awarded universities. So um, these are just some of the universities that have been accredited as universities of sanctuary. And this means they've gone through the appraisal process of um, following the principles of learning, embedding and sharing um, the principle, uh, the, the kind of principles of City of Sanctuary and uh, learning about the challenges, embedding processes that help overcome them and then sharing the good practice uh, with their communities nationally, locally and globally as well for some of the universities. So those universities really have embedded that that vision um, at every level of the university and that's um, why they were recognized for the University of Sanctuary Award to celebrate that good practice. Um, all of these universities are also passionate about facilitating this access but also there are many other fantastic universities who are working towards an award or haven't um, uh, you know formally applied for an award but are um, putting really positive processes in place uh, for people seeking sanctuary to access the scholarships, to um, help the communities themselves, volunteering programs and schemes, helping students connect with their local sanctuary seeking communities. So it's, um, it's, it's not necessarily always about access and having bursaries or scholarships, but it's about contributing to that movement of welcome and inclusivity at at every level and in any way that the university can, depending on that context. And we will be hearing about how universities in Wales do that as well, um, just as good practice examples. So why universities become universities of sanctuary? Um, there are many reasons for this, uh, that the universities decide to work towards the award or the recognition. I would say one of the most common reasons is that it works as um, a way to show that the university is seriously committed to this vision and also this is then used to stimulate and catalyze even more positive contributions where universities can work together in a network and I think most of the institutions realize the impact and the effect they can have together um, in comparison to as it's just a single university. Um, it's knowing that together they can achieve more. Uh, to learn from each other and share good practice, but also to um, have a louder voice in terms of campaigning and positive policy change in the future. Um, and there are great examples of that uh, previously as well. Um, I think there are many fantastic examples which you could see in the website or the resource pack for the Universities of Sanctuary of how universities made a difference locally, nationally or globally. One great example um, on the right hand side of the presentation that you can see here is 
a, um, a, a toolkit or a resource that uh, the University of Warwick uh, produced with um, the law department and uh, the central uh, the law department of the Warwick University and Central England Law Center. So students from the law department and um, uh, pr uh, lawyers and legal ex uh, experts in the law center work together to produce guidance that helps students with humanitarian protection status navigate and understand their rights um, in accessing um, uh, higher education and student loans. So I, I see a paper with one, so I think my time is running out, but uh, I'll be very quick. So um, I, I'll go into more detail about this in the breakout discussions later on about applying, but these are uh, initially the steps to, essentially the steps to apply to become a University of Sanctuary. So it's pledging commitment to the City of Sanctuary a vision and a charter, integrating the principles of learning, embedding and sharing at the university, and also uh, fulfilling the criteria of the resource pack. Uh, these are just some examples of how universities have previously uh, taken on these initiatives to learn, embed and share. Um, and we could, uh, I'm very um, excited to have more discussions about these, uh, to apply them to different contexts at the universities. Um, so there are really great examples of learning in terms of training staff members, um, in terms of open lecture series um, and examples of uh, students going out to the, into the community um, and, and learning from the refugee organizations and vice versa. Um, with embedding, there are, you know, the scholarships that allow students to access university, but there are also things beyond that with um, uh, building local connections and partnerships with um, refugee organizations and um, having really productive relationships with the local city and the university. And then the last principle is sharing, so spreading that ethos. Um, there is a, a great article if you have if you want an insight about how a university can help a student on an individual basis, um, which you you will find on the website here from Cardiff Met University, as a, as a Welsh example. Um, this is just a brief about how the University of Sanctuary network works, uh, how how it's structured in terms of the steering group, the resources that are there, the events and the connections that you can make as part of the network, and. Um, Moving forward, I, I just want to kind of bring your attention to the resource pack, which was um, updated last year. It has all the information you need about uh, how to start, where to start and looking at examples. Um, and then really great resource resources I want to bring your attention to as well is the Education for All resource by Article 26, um, which aims to help universities themselves support students. So it explains different immigration statuses, the asylum process, rights and entitlements. And finally, which I think was kind of mentioned before, there is um, a great resource by um, produced by the Higher Education Funding Council for Wales about really good practice examples and what uh, Welsh universities can do together. Uh, all of these links will be in the presentation, which will be sent out for more information, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions about this or uh, my personal experience in the breakout sessions. Thank you for listening. Sorry, oh, sorry. Th sorry, just before Maria, oh, thank you very much, Maria. Just as a timekeeper, please, could I urge everyone just to keep five minutes so we ensure that people get, you know, uh, their points across and course there's this kind of, you know, equal share of time. So thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Marie. Oh, thank you so much, Mariam. I thought that was a really terrific uh, presentation with lots of information. And as Hazel, our conference organiser, has um, said in the chat, all the PowerPoints and presentations will be made available on the conference website. So don't worry if you haven't been able to capture everything. And please don't worry if you put your hands up and we, we've got nearly 300 people signed up today. So it is very difficult to reply to everyone, um, but we're watching the chat, we're listening to you. And without further ado, over to Dr. Mike Chick, who is a lecturer in um, ESOL at the University of South Wales. And Mike is gonna talk about how he and his colleagues um, widened access for uh, refugees um, and how in doing so it sort of helped widen access for all. Over to you Mike. Uh, thank you Marie. Is there a PowerPoint slide please? Uh, yes I think it should be brought up by our tech team Babette. Will you take control, Mike? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So, uh, 
Good morning, Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to also thank all the speakers. Um, it's been really uh, moving and inspiring uh, listening to everyone so far. Um, I think that the speakers have inspired us all who work in this um, sector to to do more and to do as much as we can uh, to help folks um, forced to seek safety in Wales. So um, in these five minutes, I guess um, what I would like to do is to um, offer my support and encouragement uh, and any advice I can to, to any colleagues who um, work in a school or a college or a university and would like to uh, uh, do what they can to make their educational places uh, places of sanctuary and places of safety. Um, it was really heartening to, to hear Jane Hatt talk about the Welsh Government lobbying for uh, the right to work and lifting the ban and to promote ESOL uh, and also um, it was really moving listening to Stephanie talk about um, the importance of a welcome from day one. Uh, and she was talking about um, how important that is for, for people seeking sanctuary. And I think the Welsh Government's Nation of Sanctuary plan is something to make us all really proud. And that, that their stance on, on um, people seeking sanctuary and sanctuary itself is something that I, I strongly believe um, that uh, the nation can get behind. I mean, if you can see from the PowerPoint slide, back at the the end of last year and the start of this year, the Welsh Government were calling for, um, for example, the, the, the camps penale to be closed um, way before the, the, you know, the UK uh, Westminster Government opened the camps and the, the Welsh Government were vindicated in that in that stance by the camp subsequently being closed for being um, uh, unsanitary and, in my opinion, you know, inhumane. The opposite of the sort of welcome that that um, Alphonsine was talking about. And so, if you work in education and you would like to do more, then what can we do? Um, Certainly in my context, I'm fortunate enough to work in a university and the university has been um, working for a number of years on the one hand, uh, uh, leaving the campus, getting out of the campus and working with, again, as uh, Mariam said, forming collaborations outside of the university. So for the last seven years or so, we've been working with the Welsh Refugee Council to provide um, ESOL, English language classes, to folks who have been uh, uh, dispersed to Wales. We know certainly six, seven years ago, there were long waiting lists to access language classes and language we know is a, is a major barrier. The university itself um, for the last three or four years has offered uh, sanctuary schemes for people seeking asylum. So each year, two, two, there are two sanctuary scholarships for um, folks seeking asylum to study at postgraduate uh, level. But on top of this, there's also, uh, and I, I think this is really important, uh, the language bursary scheme. So we know, again, as, uh, as Stephanie was saying, refugees, people seeking sanctuary, bring with them an awful lot of experience, drive, ambition, uh, expertise and knowledge. And once you get refugee status, we know that you can access the same grants and, and loans as anybody who comes from Port Albert or Ponteberum. But what you can't access, what there isn't, is any uh, full-time uh, uh, specific language support for people wanting to begin a university degree course. And so all universities run what are called pre-sessional programs. And these are programs really designed in order for universities to get more international students onto their courses. So traditionally students from richer countries such as Saudi Arabia or China, Korea, UAE, students would come on full-time intensive language development courses in order to, to get their language competency to a level good enough to begin a degree program. And uh, one of the ways in which we support refugees at the university is by opening up places on this language preparation program for people with refugee status who wish to begin uh, a university degree. 
And so because of um, initiatives such as this, uh, last year or two years ago, we applied to be um, recognized as a university of sanctuary. And fortunately, back uh, the middle of last year, we were awarded sanctuary status. And it's, 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 it's been a real positive for the university because um, it has meant that far more students, far more staff are now aware of issues surrounding um, life as somebody seeking sanctuary and of the barriers that people with refugee status, with uh, people who are seeking sanctuary, face in trying to get into university. And things aren't perfect. It is difficult. We, we are still learning and we are doing um, as much staff training as we can. But um, we are moving forward and it has been, you know, a tremendous learning experience for all in, involved. And I'd like to repeat that, uh, that if there is anybody in a school or a college or a university who wants help or advice in this process, then please get in touch. I'm more than happy to do so. Um, and I think I should uh, uh, finish with um, a reminder that getting into university or college is not just about the, um, the actual qualification that the degree confers or the actual certificate that you get. But actually being in university means that you are far more likely to be able to integrate, to meet people, to make friends. There will be a sense of belonging because you are part of the community once you're in university. And so I think that the final word perhaps should go to one of our sanctuary scholars who, who said this about being in university. I think it's an example of you know what what's definitely called uh, the possibilities of gaining meaningful meaningful employment. Thank you. Well, thanks very much indeed, Mike. Um, I think that gives us all um, some very important practical suggestions. And now um, I'm really delighted to introduce uh, Funmi and Claudia, who've been a very important part of our conference planning team. Funmi is uh, also a sanctuary scholar at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, and a huge, um, hugely inspiring supporter of um, asylum seekers and refugees here in Swansea. And Claudia is a PhD student at Swansea University who has set up a STAR group, a Student Action for Refugee Groups. So without further ado, we're going to um, watch an interview uh, with Claudia and Funmi. Hi, Funmi. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, discuss um, today with me more about your educational experience. Um, I just, I, I do know that you've made a long journey from your home country to the UK. And I just wanted to ask you if you can briefly introduce yourself and tell us more about your uh, journey, please. Thank you, Claudia. My name is Fumi and I'm from Nigeria. At first, it was a bit challenging when I arrived in the UK with two teenagers and lots of uncertainties. It was a struggle settling down in a country different from the one you had grown up in. The food, loneliness, and experiencing culture shock. Can you please explain more about your educational journey and what education means to you? Thank you, Sally. When I arrived in Swansea and my children had started school, the first week I was bored, just sitting at home doing nothing. I made inquiries and the only option I had then was to register for the level one ESOL, which I did with great delight. I saw it as an opportunity to leave the house and learn more about the spoken and written British English. People wondered why I was doing it all, but I told them I wanted to learn more about the spoken and written British English. When I finished level one, I moved to level two. 
And at the same time, I also registered for an access to low cost. At Marie, the apparently people can't really uh, see and hear and the video. Should I carry on or? Um, I, I could see the vi and hear the video, um, but I think some people can't. Um, maybe we should come back to that and see if there's some kind of glitch. Yeah. No problems. Shall we go straight on then to the next speaker? Um, who is Lynette Thomas? And um, Lynette is a deputy director of strategy and development at the OU in Wales. And Lynette's going to talk about what the OU is um, doing in order to um, apply for the status of University of Sanctuary and the work particularly going on in Wales. So um, over to you, Lynette. Bonjour, good morning. Um, can somebody put the slides up for me, please? Yes, yeah, they're coming up now. There you are. Thank you very much. OK, well, um, my pleasure Shara de Bormas. Pleasure to speak here uh, this morning and um, what an inspirational morning it's been um, with all the speakers and, and also to hear what other universities are doing. So that's um, that's really great. Um, I thought what I would do to um, to set the scene is to explain what we are doing in the Open University in Wales to um, improve access for marginalised groups in line with our mission. And you can see that on the slide to be open to people, places, methods and ideas and our equality, diversity and inclusion work and actions for widening access through our access, participation and success strategy support students from all backgrounds and protected characteristics. And we engage with community leaders and third sector and community organisations in Wales to maximise the impact of this work. Somebody in this chat spoke about um, the OU maximising on that, and we certainly do that in Wales. And the COVID Chronicles project in Swansea is part of this work uh, where we've uh, been working with, um, with different groups in the community. So supporting the Nation of Sanctuary proposal enables us to further align these priorities within our work and our vision to reach more students with life changing learning that meets the needs and um, enriches society. So um, this conference is an important step towards the ambition of the OU to become a university of sanctuary. And I've, I've picked a small selection of our work that demonstrates our commitment to achieving that in Wales. A four month feasibility study has been commissioned across all nations within the OU and, an, and a report is expected in September with recommendations of how we can take this further. So this today's conference is a really exciting opportunity to learn from others about uh, good practice. The aim of the report is to better understand the barriers and the positions of the OU, especially fees and funding, to access the practical viability of becoming a University of Sanctuary. The study will map the different resources and networks and the academic and support activities in relation to forced migration, with a particular focus on understanding the needs of forced migrant learners, scholars and academics, and how we can meet these as a university. So this broadly aligns with areas identified in the Welsh Government Nation of Sanctuary Action Plan. And Jane Hutt um, talked about the ambitions of the of the Welsh Government earlier on, such as working towards changes to the education maintenance allowance and financial contingency fund to enable people seeking sanctuary to be eligible, ensuring refugees continue to be eligible for support, student support funding as home students through Student Finance Wales, as well as exploring potential eligibility for asylum seekers. And this work is conducted through a working group which reports to the OU wide Four Nations University of Sanctuary Steering Group, chaired by Marcia Wilson, our Dean of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. The collaboration and partnership are key to what we do in Wales and the OU in Wales is part of the Sanctuary and Higher Education Group with the high, other high, higher education act, widening access teams, 
which identifies opportunities to increase participation and retention of people seeking sanctuary in higher education. As chair of the Wales Civic Mission Network, all universities in Wales have worked together to develop a civic mission framework aligned to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. The first of its kind in the UK and the first in the world to have all universities in a nation signed up to it, the civic mission framework is intended to demonstrate the impact of the HE sector's civic mission work, to prioritise civic mission within institutions and to strengthen connections across their local communities, Wales and globally. And becoming a nation of sanctuary is part of our civic mission and highlighted by Welsh Government as a core part of universities supporting active citizenship. Importantly, this is a key tenet within the well-being goal of a more equal Wales. Advance HE is undertaking a sector-wide project on behalf of HEFCU, the Race Access and Success Collaborative Project, to support the enhancement of race equality and diversity in higher education through a whole institution approach. And we're aligning our work with people seeking sanctuary with this approach. We're also developing stronger relationships with FE colleges and adult learning Wales to ensure there are opportunities to widen progression pathways from further education into higher education. And one of the projects we have run has been the development of free open learn essential skills courses in English, which have been used by some colleges and adult learning Wales to increase in, in English language learning in a safe environment, either in a college or part of an ESOL course or directly online. Our open learn resources are freely on, available online and a great source of information and skills development for all learners. And there are over a thousand free courses ranging from health and well-being, skills and employability and academic disciplines. And our mission is simple to reach everyone that needs free access to higher education work. Our work with our partners, including those in FE and Adult Learning Wales, in developing open learn champions to increase access to our free learning and OU ambassadors to support learners to take the step from informal to formal learning are a key part of our widening access work. And we're currently scoping a potential partnership with the Welsh Refugee Council for people seeking sanctuary using open learn in improving prospects of passing IELTS exams. I end our, 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 my, this presentation by describing the work we've been doing in Swansea, delivering a series of workshops with our faculty colleagues at the Open University as part of a project called Chronicles from the Margins, working directly with people seeking sanctuary and creating a digital archive of stories of life during COVID-19. And I'll post the links in the chat for more information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Lynette. I think that gives um, a, a very good uh, idea about the range of initiatives that are going on um, at the OU, but uh, we know that we can all do more. And it's great to see in the chat people responding to uh, the speeches and um, sharing more links and information. Thank you, Lynette. Um, so as we are now um, more or less on time, um, I think I'll pass straight over to Martin Stringer, who is Pro-Vice-Chancellor Pro at Swansea University, and he's going to talk about what Swansea University is doing um, in its um, journey to becoming a University of Sanctuary. Over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be with you today. Um, it has been a very inspiring morning um, to listen to what everybody else is saying um, as we go through. I think two things really to say as sort of introduction to this. One is that probably in terms of a University of Sanctuary, um, Swansea is still very much at the beginning of its journey. Um, I think there's a lot that we have done, but there is far more that we still need to do. The second thing to say is that I'm sort of looking at this very much from the perspective of a senior leader at the university. I, I fully recognise that there are many colleagues across the university who have far more knowledge and far more direct experience of work with asylum seekers and refugees um, than I do personally. Uh, and my role in a sense is um, to facilitate, to encourage, to bring people together and to help things to work through. 
For a long time, Swansea has been hosting CARA fellows, um, refugees from other parts of the world. Um, but this was probably our only commitment, um, formal commitment to refugees and asylum seekers for quite a while. However, across the university as a whole, a lot of our colleagues have been very closely involved in this work as a, on a personal level or as part of their research, uh, rather than something that we've taken uh, across the university. So what we looked to do was really to sort of develop um, some of this work and to bring it uh, much more into the centre of the university. I do need to name check Tom Cheeseman um, from the Languages Department, who ever since I arrived at Swansea seven years ago, uh, has been sort of the conscience um, niggling me, saying, what is the university going to be doing about this? And keeping the leadership team aware of some of the work that's going on across um, the city of Sanctuary in particular. And our English language um, unit, very much like Mike was talking about in terms of um, South Wales, uh, has been providing English language support. And also um, the Academy Haltaifi has been providing Welsh language support, which is also an important part of the work. We've offered legal advice through pro bono work um, within the School of Law and uh, more recently with the Swansea Law Clinic. So there's actually quite a lot that's actually happening um, in terms of very practical support and very practical work across the university. Alongside that, there are also quite a lot of colleagues in different ways in different parts of the university involved in research. And then this is also has reached out to local community, to the city of Sanctuary, to schools in the area. So um, the question then came as sort of how do we move forward? What is it that we need to do? And it was the appointment of Paul Boyle as the vice chancellor in uh, the summer of 2018 that really provided the catalyst. He had been involved in this process at the University of Leicester and was very keen to see something develop at the University of Swansea. So we've agreed to fund a sanctuary scholarship uh, and to begin to draw together all the different work that was going on across the university. We're also keen to work uh, with colleagues across the city and began to have conversations with colleagues in the city of Sanctuary, but also other networks and groups around Swansea as part of this. Unfortunately, as we were about to get sort of move this forward, March last year, um, COVID-19 hit. Uh, from a leadership point of view, that did mean that sort of focus moved elsewhere. However, from a sort of practical perspective, in terms of the work that our colleagues were doing across the university, the COVID um, situation and the pandemic has actually led to an increase in very practical work and practical activities, um, working very closely with the City of Sanctuary and other support groups around the city to support in a very practical sense the needs of um, local asylum seekers and refugees. It also sort of gave impetus, I think, to the student body um, and their joining of the Student Action for Refugees Network, um, the STAR Network, um, which uh, we've already heard something about. Now we're looking to sort of move this forward um, and to sort of begin a sort of more formal process. We are embedding teaching on asylum and refugee issues across the university. Various different programmes already do this. We're doing more um, across to increase the sort of knowledge and information. Um, we're promoting a university wide culture of sanctuary, um, which I think is important as part of the process. And we are organising a staff development programme um, specifically around um, sanctuary principles. So there are things that we are doing as part of that work that we can lead from the centre. But again, a lot of this is activity that's happening in particular schools, in particular areas within the university. And of course, we're collaborating with colleagues um, at other universities and across um, Wales, as we've heard from the Open University and South Wales and others um, in terms of the policy and engaging alongside the government um, in a lot of this work. So we're now, I think, in a position as a university to begin to pull this work together. And the, with the support of colleagues in the city and other institutions, further education colleges, Trinity St. David, etc., we are, feel much more confident about being in a position to submit an application, possibly in the autumn, or at least make the first steps in the autumn. 
We will advertise this summer a sanctuary scholarship at the university, and we would you know, see this as an important part of the overall procedure. And we're very proud of the work that colleagues have been done doing, recognising that a lot of this is very much in their own time, very much personal passion. Um, and we want as a university to give support to colleagues, uh, both in research and scholarship, and also in the practical um, work that has been happening, uh, so that we can, as a university, play a much more positive role alongside our colleagues in other organisations. So thank you for that, um, and thank you for the opportunity to say something about what Swansea University is doing. Thank you very much indeed uh, there, Martin. I think um, it's very helpful to have a senior management perspective because at the Open University, just like at Swansea, there's an awful lot going on in different pockets around the university. Um, but the right arm often doesn't know what the left arm is doing. And it's absolutely vital that the universities take a strategic approach to ensure that they're fully behind it, not just in principle, but in practice. And quite often that means putting money where their mouth is. And that's where it always comes down to the, uh, the nitty gritty. Um, at the Open University, we have this issue too, because we're so huge. We're leading, a leading university in distance learning. If we were to offer one sanctuary scholarship and had 300 applications, then we would disappoint 299 people. So um, each university will have to find its own way to, towards becoming a university of sanctuary. And our dream and hope um, coming out of this conference today is that we can collaborate across Wales um, to, to form a network of universities of sanctuary and share um, practice and knowledge. Now, um, I'm sure many of you um, feel uh, a little bit um, um, put out because you're not able to put your hands up, but just please use the chat. Um, but now I should say it is your time to talk and I'm going to hand over to Ahmed, who's going to explain the breakout rooms to you. So um, enjoy. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to really quickly um, kind of give you the floor, really, and this will be taking you to the uh, breakout uh, session. So we want to hear about your experiences and we're also quite keen to listen to the obstacles you face in whatever role you are in. And we would like really to welcome your suggestions for solutions. So this is, as I mentioned, this is intended to be a very practical conference and uh, you know we will be writing up uh, a report which can kind of uh, share uh, we will share afterwards so based on the contribution so while we are having amazing speakers we need your insights actually also uh, to make a difference uh, when it comes to changing things so um, again uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to move to the uh, to the parallel session. So this is uh, the title is the higher education uh, breakout uh, uh, parallel sessions. So there will now be uh, an option of four different parallel sessions. Please uh, click a topic of your choice, which uh, will take you to a room uh, uh, for kind of presentations and uh, discussions. They've already been put in the chat. And you can also kind of press it on, you can find it on the screen. Please uh, use uh, any of one of these links to join the session uh, of, uh, of your choice. All right, everyone. Um, welcome back to the, uh, uh, the main session. So um, a very warm welcome again. Um, roaming across the breakout rooms, I now know that the conversations, experiences and insights shared are going to be hugely valuable to us um, when we write up our conference report. So uh, let's share some of those uh, insights now. And this will be done over the coming 30 minutes or so. And they, um, the discussion will be chaired uh, by uh, Marie Glissipi. So over to you, Marie. 
Hang on, Ahmad, I think Marie is not yet in the room, not yet back in the room. No worries, we'll just give it a few extra seconds to allow Marie back into the room because as there have been quite a lot of these rooms, um, lots of discussions, and I'm sure there will be some really interesting um, sort of feedback. So we'll, we'll just wait a few extra seconds to allow Marie back uh, into the room. So welcome back, everybody. So over to you, Marie, now uh, to chair the plenary. We've got 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. So uh, over to you. Thank you very much. I I, um, I was struggling to see the resume button. <laughs> um, OK, so um, the first group to report back is Pathways from Further to Higher Education. Um, would the people who are or the person who is feeding back raise their hand so that um, Babette, our magnificent tech person, can um, give them access? So is that Paul or is it Joshua? Oh, that's I Caroline. Um, uh, OK, here we are. So Caroline, I don't think you're quite on yet, so you can turn your camera off perhaps. OK, Joshua is on. Great. So Joshua. Oh, oops, here we go. OK, Joshua, you can unmute yourself now. There we are. Sorry, a couple of uh, tech issues there. Hopefully you can hear me and, and see me now. Um, yeah, we had a, a lengthy discussion around a couple of different topics um, sort of facilitated by Paul. Um, lots of people chipping in um, around the different areas. And we sort of had four main I picked out sort of four main issues that, that we saw being the barriers um, to FE and HE. Uh, and that is sort of a, a digital literacy uh, barrier. Um, not everybody is digitally literate, um, but we can't put, sort of put everybody into one group. Um, there might be some patronizing thoughts going forward if we are offering this out to every single refugee and asylum seeker. Most already have smartphones. Um, most have already done degrees and qualifications in their own countries. Um, so, so digital literacy was a barrier, but we can't sort of put all our eggs into one basket and it kind of needs to be delivered across uh, the whole of the, the spectrum. The, the second one that kind of came out was um, funding, um, you know, the housing, having, only having, we heard from uh, Rishma, one of our students at Gower College said, that £37 a week is definitely not enough. Um, one of the ways that we overcame that was uh, free bus passes, but not everybody has access to that. Um, another one that we mentioned right at the end there was about childcare. Not enough is being done about free childcare. Many uh, young women are coming across previously married, things like that, that have already got young children as well that are having to pay for that whilst going through. Um, and also um, a point around prior qualifications not being counted now that they're come, they've come into this country. Some might already have um, qualifications such as degrees, um, doctorates, things like that, that aren't being counted when they come across. Um, so whether something across the board could be done um, towards that. I'm not sure if, if Paul picked up anything else or would like to add anything else to that. I don't think Paul is Paul in the room. We haven't seen him yet. Uh, yeah, Paul, can you put your hand up and then ba Babette can unmute you. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks for that. And you can turn the camera on. Um, I don't believe it's letting me turn my camera on. I've only got the mute option. But, oh, here we go. Yeah, th thanks for that, Josh. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, I'm not sure how much jo uh, Josh has got into you, but um, I did hear he, he picked out some of the key points we talked about. Um, there was a huge discussion on, on digital literacy um, 
and it, they're just not being enough provision for it. So there needs to be a real push, um, I think, at Welsh government level on creating uh, an, an easier way of accessing both the internet and digital devices, because you know we now live in a digital world, so to take part in this society and, and not have adequate internet access um, or equipment kind of means you are excluded from that society and you can't contribute to it or engage with it in a meaningful manner. Um, briefly, we, we touched upon as well as that, um, making sure that you are digitally uh, literate, but not just singling out um, refugees and asylum seekers, because it might make them across as condescending, seeing as, you know, a lot of the people have already got, you know, fan fantastic uh, IT skills already. Um, so making sure that that provision is, is offered in addition to uh, not as a proviso to a, obtaining devices or access. Um, there was a, a wonderful suggestion right at the end there because we, we touched upon not having um, firm information points for people seeking education and being told a lot of conflicting information. Um, you know, being told you're an asylum seeker, you actually can't study at FE level or you need to do this qualification beforehand or that that qualification actually doesn't uh, mean you can attend this, you need to do a different one. Um, so right at the end, I noticed that um, we had a suggestion there to build an access to education uh, website, um, you know, collect a lot of pathways to usual careers and link with people for opportunities and mentors there. Um, so yeah, we, we looked at that way as a way of overcoming that barrier. And I'm not sure if uh, if I've left anything out, Josh, feel free to jump in and tell me. I think you've uh, you've covered everything there. Fantastic. Brilliant. Thanks for your time. Thanks ever so much, Josh and uh, Paul. I do know um, from on the local grapevine that um, you all do wonderful work um, and the, the students uh, in the asylum and refugee community here in Swansea really, really appreciate the work that you do. So thanks a lot. And uh, let's hopefully stay in touch. Great points. Um, we'll come back to those um, in the final discussion. Next um, is applying to become a University of Sanctuary and I think uh, Aditya Ray and Lydia Danku are going to report back. Could you put your hands up so Babette um, can see you and unmute you? And yeah, they can both already speak now. Thank you very much. I can, I'm happy to make a start on this. So um, in our room, we had uh, Mariam, um, who expanded a little bit on um, what, it, uh, what the steps are for becoming a university on sanctuary, which has been very useful. We own, also spoke a little bit about um, barriers um, to becoming um, a university of sanctuary and barriers to um, for forced migrants. Um, to accessing higher education. Um, we had a guest, uh, Hiba Mahmoud uh, Alwadi, who is um, one of our new students studying psychology at the Open University, and she's a refugee from Syria. And uh, she mentioned a couple of barriers that she has faced herself in further education um, in terms of uh, having the right language skills and having the right level of academic English in order to study. Um, but also, as mentioned previously, um, her prior qualifications and experience not being um, recognized, not being taken into consideration. We also spoke about um, other other barriers uh, such as funding, uh, being classed as an international student when uh, when you're an asylum seeker and how that uh, pretty much prices you out of uh, higher education. Um, we spoke a little bit about activity at the Open University. Um, which is dispersed across uh, faculties, across the uh, departments. Um, we've got activity in research, we've got um, collaboration with partners in voluntary and community organizations, um, various projects for employability, study skills. We have uh, students in refugee camps in Jordan and Lebanon. However, um, as I said, this activity is dispersed um, as it is very often with uh, many other higher education institutions and the need to gather this activity and to integrate it um, and to allow um, to allow this work to take an all institutional approach. 
Um, we also mentioned the importance of networks, uh, sanctuary networks, and how much we benefited um, from tapping into those networks in Scotland. Um, when we, um, very early on in the work, we met with the Edinburgh University, uh, with CARA, and um, with the University of St Andrews, um, and we learned a little bit about their experience and their journey of becoming universities of sanctuary and um, how we can apply that to, to us and to our university offering at the Open University. Um, we've also spoken about um, um, an idea of um, having ambassadors, sanctuary ambassadors that can be, that can body up with uh, potential um, um, refugee um, or asylum seeking scholars at the Open University and provide them support. Um, and we also mentioned how uh, the need to work across categories um, and to work um, intersectionally and how uh, forced migrants aren't um, recognized as a, as a, or rather mentioned um, in our various uh, targets uh, that we need to achieve um, as a category, but how they fit under various different categories um, that we do have targets for. So how we need to, to work um, intersectionally um, in that way. Um, I don't know if I've missed anything else, Aditya, that you can um, add um, to the study. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much uh, most of it. Uh, just like to add that uh, we had a representative from CARA and she was very keen on telling us to uh, put lived experiences uh, in front of uh, the higher management, which has a keen role to play uh, in getting us through, uh, through the line uh, while we make the application. Uh, we also had, uh, again, the emphasis on up, upper management and how to uh, basically uh, get them on board and how we can work uh, towards uh, long-term planning, uh, not just uh, getting the application through, but for the next three years, thinking about what kind of activities, what kind of um, resources will we need to uh, actually invest in uh, so that we can make this a more sustainable program and not just sort of getting an award uh, in itself. Um, so more or less, uh, uh, I mean, one thing that we did our presentation on is essentially telling us that, uh, telling people that we are uh, doing a feasibility study right now and we would be reaching out to the people who have attended this conference, but also, uh, you know, we would be asking you people to contribute uh, through your own networks, uh, information about existing resources, ex existing um, uh, networks that you may have, uh, you know, with relation to your work in this field, uh, in the field of, uh, you know, whether you're assisting forced migrants, whether you, you have forced migrant learners, uh, whether you are an AL or whether you are uh, an alumni, uh, we would uh, like to hear from you. And um, Lydia and I uh, are, are, are actually leading on this. So, uh, you know, we welcome all uh, all emails and we'd be putting it out on different forums. We've already put some of some of it out on the internet and we would be setting up a website which will which will be available very soon uh, for you to contribute your uh, your two bits on. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very, very much uh, Aditya and Lydia for a very comprehensive um, report back. It was a great breakout session. Thank you. And now um, to the uh, being a University of Sanctuary, which um, uh, the facilitator was Caroline Thraves, and I'm not sure who's doing the report back. Is it Mohammed, or are you going to do it? I have the report back, and then if Mohammed wants to add anything, then he can. Um, so we talked um, some similar things that have been raised previously. We talked about the importance of um, having an alignment between uh, the strategic and operational work in the university that um, whilst it was really important that the, the people on the ground that were doing this great work were, were, were driving initiatives forward. This has to be matched by a strategic um, desire from the university. We, you, you couldn't have strategic without the operational. You couldn't have the operational without the strategic. So it's the alignment of, of those two aspects of, um, of, of how the university operates that we, we felt was important. Um, and um, the, the, a lot. Of what was interesting was a lot of um, there was a lot of shared, similar shared experiences. We talked about how it's really important for our support services to 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 talk to each other for there to be processes so that, for instance, if you know. It, it, 
if somebody in, in registry has an issue that they know who to talk to in finance about it and vice versa so that our our sanctuary scholars don't get fee uh, billed for their fees when that should have been flagged up in in an admissions um, process. So an alignment of our services um, was something that um, that we shared in in conversation with with colleagues from other institutions who were who were doing similar work. And from um, from some of the sanctuary um, seekers, the sanctuary scholar. Um, uh, applicants and, and uh, scholars that we had in the room uh, and importance we, we flagged up the need for there to be a, a point of contact for those um, sanctuary scholars to go to that could help with any queries and so forth and um, and we flagged this up as being an important thing from an institutional perspective but from the sanctuary scholars perspective they felt that it needed to be somebody who was really passionate and that cared and that it wasn't just a, a sort of an, an anonymous post that and and i think that was something that was really quite important for um for higher education institutions and and, and, and other institutions to learn from um, listening to the, the words of um, the sanctuary scholars and then we we talked around um, this issue that I know Marie you you've mentioned to me in the past. You know how many scholarships um, is enough? Okay, you know we have four at the University of Wales Trinity St David. I'd like to think we we will have more. Um, you know uh, we we heard that there were two in Cardiff. Um, so it, you know it isn't enough. So you know how far can you stretch them? So we. We talked about, um, you know, how how we were able to to achieve a greater scope, um, with with these really. But um, Ma, I don't know if Mohammed or, or if Chris had anything to add. But um, Mohammed, I'm sorry if you if you would like to put your hand up and say anything, please do. Yeah, I'm okay. What I'm agree with what she said. Only I will add about the mic. The I'm very impress the views and experience shared by Mike. I don't know his full name. I miss his name. And especially when he was talking about few projects, like speak to me and other project. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And you, you yourself are a sanctuary scholar at uh, University of Wales, Trinity St. David's, aren't you? So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's my pleasure here. It's my forward to hearing more about your experiences in due course. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you very much indeed, and Mohammed. And now um, to the final report back, um, which is um, student outreach, support and engagement. And I think the report back is going to be um, by Suki Haider and Claudia Krogelak. Could you put your hands up, please, Suki and Claudia? So Babette can give you the floor. Thank you. Oh, Suki was, hang on, Suki has disappeared. I'm here. Okay, hang on, sorry. Okay, Suki, you can, you can unmute yourself. And is it also uh, Claudia or Jill? Oh, you're both here. Okay, yeah, great. You can un unmute yourself. And put your cameras on. Please. Claudia, do you, do you want to start and I'll chip in or should we do it the other way around? I, I don't mind. Yeah, um, I can start if, uh, if it is okay. okay. So we have discussed um, the main barriers which also other groups um, identified already. Um, some of them being the um, access to the language uh, barrier, which we discussed, access to technology and um, Wi-Fi, which is really difficult for asylum seekers and refugees to access data and also difficult to, um, to uh, pay for it. And, um, and one of the other barriers we discussed was um, lack of knowledge about the labor market and um, finding scholarship um, throughout the universities. So asylum seekers and refugees, um, uh, it is really difficult for them to um, find scholarships and find support through the university. Um, 
and we spoke about different solutions. Um, we said that social media would be really good to start conversations as it encourages um, involvement um, without a huge time commitment, um, funding scholarship, uh, which is um, a key to for the refugees and asylum seekers to access higher education and go to the university. Um, we also said um, creating a sense of welcome is really important. Um, as going to the university is not just about um, getting a certificate, it is important to inte integrate it into the university community as it is difficult to sometimes feel as a member of the community and um, we don't want to put that um, burden on forced migrants um, to you know, share their experiences. We want to understand how we can um, help them to help us instead. Um, would you like to add anything, uh, Suki? Yeah, just a few things we said that um, in sharing stories, we should be moving away from text. Let's have far more uh, creative options. And we shared some good practice here about photographs and art and poetry. And, uh, and also from our participants, we had good practice about building a sense of belonging um, language clubs uh, so um, a spanish english conversation club can really help asylum seekers and refugees not feel excluded from the community so so the problems as claudia said um definitely language and it skills but we saw a role for student mentors there and so so we hope we can take that forward. There's already mentoring happening at the OU and um, our colleagues in the chat were pointing out that uh, our level two students could mentor our language, um, our level one students, so our year one students on particularly these issues, so language and how to use IT. You know, so you might be given a tablet or a laptop, but being able to navigate your course website, know how to uh, submit an assignment, those types of things we thought students could get involved with, which links back to the value of setting up a star group. Um, and the other thing that we said was important was um, how universities communicate. So not only um, universities of sanctuary but while they're becoming university of sanctuaries the universities need to do more in supporting forced migrant student applicants because um, we had a, a case study there where it sounded really difficult to get information so not only about um, UCAS but also whether this student had managed to get a scholarship because there was no named person so we we really saw the value of the University of Sanctuary system of having one person that the student can refer to throughout their journey and uh, yeah so communication was a constant theme in our group the importance of good communication to build a, a sense of belonging, to help people feel in control and really to move this agenda forward. Um, and it was good that, Lydia, you know, you um, called for people at the OU to get involved because certainly we had AL colleagues in our group who want to know what's happening and who want to get involved. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed um, to everybody. Uh, now we have five minutes for anybody who um, would like to um, share their experiences or make a point or pose a question. So um, either you can put your hand up or I could just um, refer to a few points that have been mentioned. Alan Thomas who's going to be chairing the afternoon session, um, has just made a really good point about how scholarships um, need to, uh, for, force, for all forced migrants, should be charged at home fees only. And he says, could, the, could this be a, poli could be a policy of each institution or even a Welsh government policy? And I think Scotland already has such a policy. Anybody? Now about that, oh, we've got Jenny Williams. Jenny, would you like to, Babette, would you hand the uh, chat over to Jenny? Yep, it's done. Thank you, Jenny. If you Jenny, could... you can you can unmute yourself, Jenny. 
And put your camera on. Trying to. OK. Yep, all done. It's all right, great. OK. Um, well, this is about, let me see. I, I'm sort of got a bit confused with trying to get the things on. Um, just talking about bursaries. What were you we talking about? I'm sorry. Uh, we were just talking about um, charging uh, home fees rather than. Oh, right. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. I'm so, so embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. Home, home member. Well, it's absolutely impossible. I remember one of our members, she had a place in Morriston to study to be a, um, uh, um, a nurse. She already had a degree in, um, in uh, biology and had worked in labs in Algeria. She went, she moved to London and nowhere could she find anywhere where she wouldn't be charged, even as an, a refugee, um, for th for as other than as an international student. So the fact that you may be a refugee, you may be an asylum seeker and wanting to have home fees, but you may be a refugee and not be able to access them either, because it's only if you have indefinite leave to remain. It's certainly in England, so that if you've only got three years and or you've only got five years and you may have been here 10, but it doesn't make any difference. You'll still be charged international fees unless you can get a bursary. Thank you for that important point, Jenny. And it, it, it highlights the differences between England, Wales and Scotland. And uh, it can be extremely and Northern Ireland, of course, it can be extremely confusing. Um, another point that has been brought up again uh, and again in the breakout runs is the the problems surrounding uh, uh, internet access, specifically for asylum seekers in home office accommodation. Has anybody um, got anything they'd like to add to those points? Because this, again, especially um, during the pandemic, has been an absolutely fundamental issue. Uh, we've got Caroline, you'd like to chip in here. I, I would agree that that has been a challenge that our sanctuary scholars have, have faced and we've we've had to keep purchasing um, dongles for internet access because we can't buy an, a contract for them. We, we're, we're unable to buy a, a contract so we keep having to buy dongles. But the last year we've been pretty much working all online with just very... Um, pockets of time where our, um, our students have been able to come in. So when you consider how much time that those um, sanctuary scholars have been um, needed to access the internet, it's been a massive challenge. And it was something that I hadn't really thought, um, you know, thought about too much until until I've, I've seen the struggles from some of our uh, students. So yeah, we just support that is, is an issue. Thank you. Thank right. I think we've got the time for only one more contribution um, before we go to our lunch break. All right. Um, we do have a hand up by Jamila. So over to Jamila. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm based in Glasgow. Uh, we used to drive uh, language courses before the lockdown. And uh, during the lockdown, we tried to, to move it to online. Unfortunately, we, we couldn't access the asylum seeker because they have no access to internet. Yeah, and then uh, we tried to help them, but we couldn't. And uh, I don't know, I, I have not heard they provided by internet, by home office or something like this. So this is something new for me. Yeah, I think this is going to be an absolutely vital issue going forward and we have found that um, we're all privileged if we've got bank accounts and we can get a, a contract but for asylum seekers on pay-as-you-go to attend a meeting like this it would cost five pounds for an hour and if you're on 37 pounds odd a week then that's a lot of money mm -hmm. and i see that you're going to um bring us to a close so over to you Thank you very much, uh, Marie, for being such a great chair, spot on time. And also I'd like to thank 
uh, everyone for their contributions and feedback. So um, thank you very much. And this brings us to the end of the first half of today's conference, which was on access to higher education.